Let's talk about fear for a moment. What are the things that you're afraid of? I, I looked online and I found the top 10 phobias. And I thought we could start with a little quiz this morning um, of what these phobias are. The first one, we'll start with an easy one. Arachnophobia. Arachnophobia. Who knows what that is? Fear of spiders. Let's see. Yeah. How many people have a little arachnophobia? <laughs> Some people's hands like shot way up. Okay, a little bit more difficult. The next one, aphidiophobia. Is it a fear of heights, a fear of dogs, or a fear of snakes? Somebody said snakes over here right away. Do you have aphidiophobia? <laughs> fear of snakes, absolutely. Fear of snakes. Lots of people. Aphidiophobia. Uh, okay, next one. This one's a little harder to say. Teromahanophobia. Teromahanophobia. Teromah- is it? Is it the fear of injections? The fear of thunder and lightning or the fear of flying? Survey says fear of flying. You didn't know that one, did you? Next time you're talking with somebody and you're like, no, I have pteromahovophobia. I can't say it, but I have it. Last one. No, not the last one. Second to last one. Mysophobia. Mysophobia. The fear of mice, right? Mysophobia. Is it a fear of heights? Is it a fear of germs? Or the fear of social situations? Whoever said germs is correct. This is the fear of germs or dirt. Mysophobia. Okay, here's the last one. Alethophobia. Alethophobia. This one's really obscure. Are you ready for this? It is the fear of truth. The fear of truth. We're going to talk about that today in our passage We've been through the book of Ecclesiastes now for a few months. We're on the eighth week, and this is the final sermon in Ecclesiastes. And I'm a little bit bummed because I've really enjoyed this series. Uh, It spoke to me a lot. Uh, Maybe that's because um, I'm a little melancholy or something, or I'm a glass-half-empty person sometimes. But for whatever reason, Ecclesiastes was just real, and I loved it. Um... And we're switching here, if you notice, if you take your Bibles and look at chapter 12, verse 9, it switches from a first-person voice where the preacher himself is talking now to a third person where there's a a commenter or an editor that is going to summarize the book. And he summarizes the book with what is perhaps the most important theme in the book, which is to fear God. The preacher has said this in Ecclesiastes Six times he's repeated it. You know, if something's important, it's a good idea to repeat it. If something's important, it's a good idea to repeat it. If something's important, it's a good idea to repeat it. You'll remember something that was repeated. So let's see what he has to say, starting at verse 10. Look in your Bibles with me. He says... The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote wrote words of truth. He said nice things, words of delight. In the book, if you remember, there were some poems in there, there was some verse in there, there were proverbs in there, and they were delightful. But he also was interested in the truth, and the challenge with the truth is that it's not always pleasant. Truth is critical. It was critical in his day, it's critical in our day, and it's critical every day in between. And the problem is, in his culture and ours, there is a war on truth. Here's the reason. Sometimes the truth hurts. Sometimes the truth hurts. Look what he says in verse 11. The words of the wise are like, what's your Bible say? Goads and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. What's a goad? Well, luckily for you, I brought a goad. I made it. 
but it is a legitimate goat. It's a staff, and on the end of the staff is a nail. Now, this was used in ancient times to goad or to prod livestock. A shepherd would have a goad like this, and if he saw the sheep going somewhere that they weren't supposed to go, he would give them a little poke. Boom. And it would, it would cause the sheep to go, oh, okay, I'm going to go the other way. The shepherd used this to make sure the sheep were safe. So, for example, if the sheep was getting too close to a rocky outcropping, he would say, boom, there's a goad. And the sheep would say, oh, okay, all right, all right, let me get back on the path. If the sheep was going to drink some water that was not safe, the shepherd might give it a little poke. Move on. And the sheep would say, okay, all right, all right, I won't drink that water. He says, the truth, it's like a goad, like a nail, firmly fixed. Think of some of the things that the preacher has said that were uh, like prodding, and they might have hurt a little bit to the listener. In chapter 2, he said, pleasure and money and fame and reputation, vanity. Vanity, worthless. In chapter 3, he said, death comes to everyone. I mean, that kind of hurts a little bit. I did a a funeral, a memorial yesterday for someone who had passed away. And I reminded everybody in attendance, like, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. It's, I looked up the statistics. It's one per person. <laughs> kind of hurts, doesn't it? That's what the preacher said. Chapter 7, he said, everyone has sinned. There's not a righteous person on the earth. Chapter 9, he said, the hearts of every human is evil. What was he doing? He was trying to motivate his reader to change. He was trying to prod them towards the truth. Now, I should tell you this. Not everybody appreciates prodding. In our culture, some people say, that's bullying. I don't want to hear the truth. That makes me feel bad. Or they say, oh, you're shaming me. And so to avoid that pain, many people would rather create their own truth. This is a fairly new thing. I mean, I feel like within the last decade, you have this idea like, oh, I'll have my truth, and you have your truth. My truth is based on my lived experience, and you have your truth based on your lived experience. Well, there's a problem with that. We may interpret the truth differently. It may impact us differently, but the truth is the truth. You can't have two versions of the truth. That's a real challenge. And the reality is a lot of Christians kind of do that too when it comes to the Bible. Well, there's sections of the Bible that I don't consider my truth. I don't like them. They make me feel bad. What's God saying? Here's the truth. But God, I don't want to forgive My friend, I don't want to forgive my husband. I can't forgive that person who wronged me. And what does he say? I forgave you. You forgive others. God, I know that it says that I should keep my relationship pure, but my boyfriend and I, or my girlfriend and I, we are living together. And God says, that's not the way to do it. Boom, keep the marriage bed pure. He's prodding you to the truth. Why? Because he wants to hurt you? No, this won't hurt. It will keep you on the straight and narrow. That's what it is. He says, the words of truth, they're like goads, like nails, firmly fixed. And then in verse 11, he finishes by saying, they're given by one shepherd. Now, this is a very clear reference to the coming Messiah. This phrase is used only two other times in the Bible, both in the book of Ezekiel, both predicting the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus is that one shepherd. He's that good shepherd. And anybody hearing this would instantly see a visual image of a shepherd with a goad making sure his sheep are safe. He's saying Jesus is that 
shepherd. It's interesting, too, because um, there's a story about a guy whose name was Saul. You might know this story, but Saul was a persecutor of Christians. He hated Christians. His job was to destroy Christianity. And one day he was on the road... And the road was leading to a place called Damascus. And his goal was to go to Damascus because he was hunting down Christians. And all of a sudden, this light comes out of heaven, knocked him flat on the ground, and he heard a voice. It was the voice of Jesus. And this is what Jesus said um, on the screen. We'll put it. Acts chapter 26. When he had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice. That's Saul saying to me in Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. This is Jesus talking to Paul saying, I've been prodding you and you've been kicking. See, sometimes if the sheep didn't like it or the animal didn't like it, they would kick that goad. Say, get out of here, I'll do my own thing. He says, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. What's Jesus saying to Paul? Why are you avoiding me? I want what's best for you. Here's my question. Are you kicking against the goads? Are you avoiding the truth? Are you avoiding the truth of the gospel? Are you avoiding the truth of the scriptures? Are you avoiding truth that's coming to you from people that are trusted, who are sharing the truth? Even if it hurts a little bit, are you avoiding the church, the truth? Are you going your own way? Or will you be, will you be willing to listen to the one shepherd? Verse 12, he gives us a warning The editor says, My son, beware of anything beyond these, of making books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. What does he say? Beware of, I'll I'll call it, comfortable lies. Beware of trying to find information that doesn't prod you, but makes you feel good and comfortable. He says, a lot of people will write a lot of things. You should be careful. You need to take heed of the truth. That way you'll know the difference between the truth and a lie. Here's the thing. As humans, we gravitate toward information that makes us feel good. We gravitate towards that information. We want to feel good. We don't always want to be prodded. I want to show you a New Testament example Turn in your Bibles, if you would. Don't lose your place in Ecclesiastes. But turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy. This is close to the back of your Bible. Second Timothy is uh, the second letter that was written from Paul, who, by the way, was Saul. That was his name before he uh, became a believer. So this is the guy who kicked against the goads. And he's writing to his protege, a young man named Timothy, who was a young pastor. And he's writing to Timothy, and he's encouraging him to stay faithful to the truth. And he gives him this warning, and this is a verse... um, I'll start at verse 2. He says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, that's, that's a goad, Exhort with complete patience and teaching. Here's the key, verse 3. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. This is the verse in, uh, I love the way the New Century Version uh, puts it. This is the New Century Version. Same verse, but it just phrases it a little bit better. It says, because the time will come when people will not listen to the true teaching, but will find many more teachers who please them by saying the things they want to hear. It's okay if you leave church after reading the Bible and feel a little bit prodded. It's okay if you open the word and you feel some conviction about where your life is at. That's the truth. That's the goad. That's God saying, hey, Stay on the right path here. I only want what's best for you. We don't want that a lot of times as a culture. I've heard it a couple of times. Believe it or not, I've actually heard two or three times people say, I like LifePoint, but you use the Bible too much. It's like going to the hospital and saying, yeah, but you use too much medicine. 
I actually had one person say, ah, I'm not coming anymore because I don't like hearing about the Old Testament God. It's tantalizing to only hear what we want. And some even think it's biblical. That's one of the things that worries me is, you know, as a culture, we're really not into this book as much as we should be. Biblical illiteracy is at an all-time high, even though we have more copies of the Bible than you can imagine. And a lot of people think there are things in the Bible that aren't in the Bible. They think it's in the Bible, but they don't really know. And when it comes time to defend their position, they can't because they don't know this word that's really dangerous. Now, coming up in, in uh, the summer, I just I have a series that I've planned, and the series is called The Bible Doesn't Say That. It's like all the things you think the Bible says, but it doesn't actually say. I'm excited about that series. But the final verse is the commenter, the editor drives the point home. Look at verse 13. He says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. I'm going to summarize this whole thing for you. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Simple. Fear God. Fear God. Now, this is not a new idea in the Bible. This has been basically from the beginning. Here's what Moses wrote uh, to the Israelites in the book of Deuteronomy. It says, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to what? Fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways to love him, to serve the Lord your God and with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. Fear God and keep his commandments. Now, what does it mean to fear God? Well, it's simple. It's respect for his word. It's respect for his authority. It's respect for his power. Now, the preacher talked about this in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Just turn back a few pages to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Here's what he says in verse 14. He says, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. In some versions, it says, God has done it so that the people are in awe of him. Think about what God has done. He created everything with a word. He spoke dimension into existence. With a word, he spoke time into an existence. With a word, he spoke stars and planets and galaxies by the trillions into existence. And remember, it wasn't even hard. That's the God we're talking about. It makes total sense to fear that God. That's not a rational fear. That's a healthy respect for the God of the universe. And then he says in verse 14, For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. That kind of scares me a little bit. Every secret thing, every thought you've ever had, anything you've ever said and done, God knows. And it says he's going to bring that into judgment. It's interesting. One of my favorite memes is this meme where it's like, only God can judge me. And it says, yeah, you should be scared. That should scare you. I've seen people with tattoos. Only God can judge me. Do you know what that means? Everything in the book of Ecclesiastes is meant to drive this point home. Every section, every paragraph, every poem, every proverb is meant for you to decide what will you do with God? Will you fear him or will you ignore him? Again, people don't like to hear about this God of judgment. They would rather fashion a God that is accepting and flexible and nice, kind of like a grandpa in a rocking chair that gives you a Werther's candy. <laughs> this God wouldn't judge anybody because we're all his children. This God accepts everyone no matter what they believe because after all, God is love. Guess what? That may be your truth, but it's not the truth. Here's the truth. God is 100% holy. 
He cannot diminish his glory by being in the presence of sin. And that should be a problem for everyone because like the preacher said in chapter 7, no one is good. All have sinned. There is no one righteous. Nobody has the ability to stand before God without facing his wrath. And that's where the book ends. This is amazing. If you just look at the end of this book, for God will bring everything into judgment, whether good or evil, the end. Sleep tight. If I'm reading this, this is a terrible motivation. I'm like, well, well, I better keep the commands of God. That's the only way to escape his judgment. Okay, Pastor Phil, I heard you loud and clear. I am going to be a better Christian from now on. I'm going to sing the songs. I'm going to come to church on time. I'll even serve. I'll serve in the nursery if you want me to. I'm going to keep those commands. I don't want to be judged. But you know what? What if you mess up? You're going to mess up, right? I mean, I'm going to mess up. We're all going to mess up. Then what? And this is where a lot of people reside, right? They're trying to do their best to please God. Either one, because they're going to fall short, and then that just makes them feel guilty. And I know a lot of people, they just walk into the church every single Sunday just like, oh, I'm just not a good enough Christian. Or B, they give up altogether. Because they're like, "Ah, I could never be good enough. So forget it. I'll worry about that judgment later. But if you look at this and feel hopeless, all you need to do is just flip forward to the New Testament. Remember, the preacher only had a vague idea of something that was better. He foreshadowed the coming of something better. He couldn't see it clearly. Like Paul said in 1 Corinthians, we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. He foreshadowed the coming of a solution. Even the editor of the last section predicts the coming of one shepherd, the Messiah. And in the New Testament, the story of Jesus is from Matthew to Revelation. It's the story of God bridging the gap and providing a safeguard from his own judgment. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 5. I'll put up on the screen. Truly I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has what? Eternal life. life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Belief in Jesus provides a pathway to holiness and allows us into the presence of of that perfect God and there will be judgment God will bring everything into account you can look at this later but in the book of Revelation chapter 20 John sees this vision of judgment he says there's a throne and he says it's so cool to see he says on this throne thunder and lightning had to hide because of the power of of Jesus on that throne. And the Bible says that the people lined up to face judgment and a book was opened. It was the book of life. And as people stand in front of that throne, with that book open, there's a simple search. Is your name in here? If your name is in here, you pass from judgment. If your name is in here, You are looked at and said, you can go. You're free. I I admit, it makes me a little bit nervous to think about what that's like, to stand there. Or maybe I shouldn't be nervous. Maybe I should think in confidence. I'll walk right up there. Yes. A-A-Y-R-E-S. It's my name. I'm in that book. That's an important question. This might be the most important thing you hear today or maybe ever. Here's the question. Is your name in that book? Are you ready for this? Because if it's not, you will face judgment. Now, it doesn't give me any pleasure to say that at all. 
Because I would stand under that judgment. The only difference is that I have given my life to Christ and I do my best to please him and to follow his commands. But the truth is when I mess up, Jesus Christ has already forgiven me. That's called justification. You are justified through the blood of Jesus Christ. I hope that is true for you. I hope it's true for you. As always, if there's anything we can do to guide you, to tell you more about what it means to trust in Jesus Christ, to avoid judgment, we would love to do that. Let's pray.